Good afternoon, and uh, welcome back to our 4 p.m. service. I do have a couple reminders, and that is, first of all, that Blast is Wednesday night. And so if you haven't signed up yet for the dinner, if you would do that tonight, and also Good Friday services this Friday night at 7 p.m., uh, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So invite all of you to that. And having said all that, if you would stand now, we're going to have a moment of silent prayer and prepare ourselves for worship tonight, and so let's come before him. Father, we thank you for the privilege to come back to worship again this afternoon, and we pray that you would bless this service and use it uh, not only for our benefit, but Lord, most importantly, for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship this afternoon is from Psalm 50. Psalm 50. The psalmist says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Uh, you notice the, the two parts at the end of that passage. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. And God has delivered us. He set you free and me free from our sins. He's given us eternal life, and now it's our calling throughout our lives and also on the day of rest uh, to bring glory and honor to him. And he now greets us, and so receive the greeting of our God and King grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to confess the Apostles' Creed together. If those words are uh, not familiar to you, it's on page 148 uh, in the Forms and Prayers book, but typically on Sunday nights we uh, confess the Creed together as a reminder of the essentials of the Christian faith. And so let's say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's respond by singing number 153, O Day of Rest and Gladness. Uh, this is a day of rest for us. It's also a day of gladness because we uh, not only get to see our fellow believers, but we also get to hear the good news of the gospel. So we'll sing the four stanzas and let's remain standing as we sing.
We are continuing to make our way through the Canons of Dort, and so if you would take the Forms and Prayers book and turn to page 274. Uh, we're going to read tonight uh, from page 274, Article 15 of the third and fourth main points of doctrine in the Canons of Dort. Article 15, page 274. It says, God does not owe this grace to anyone. For what could God owe to one who has nothing to give that can be paid back? Indeed, what could God owe to one who has nothing of his own to give but sin and falsehood? Therefore, the person who receives this grace owes and gives eternal thanks to God alone. The person who does not receive it either does not care at all about these spiritual things and is satisfied with himself in his condition or else in self-assurance foolishly boasts about having something which he lacks. Furthermore, following the example of the apostles, we are to think and to speak in the most favorable way about those who outwardly profess their faith and better their lives, for the inner chambers of the heart are unknown to us. But for others who have not yet been called, we are to pray to the God who calls, all th calls things that do not exist as though they did. In no way, however, are we to pride ourselves as better than they, as though we had distinguished ourselves from them. There is uh, what theologians often refer to as the external call of the gospel. In other words, the, the gospel is to go out to all people. We don't just preach the gospel to the elect because we don't know who the elect are. We are to preach the gospel to everyone. But as we preach the gospel, as we proclaim the good news, we, we know that there are different responses to the good news. Some, by the grace of God, believe. Some embrace Christ. Some, to use the, the language that I used this morning, some get out of the boat and, and run to Jesus and embrace him for salvation. That makes up us tonight. We have come to Christ and believed in him. Others, however, do not believe. You, you may know people, you may work with people, you may um, even live with people, you may go to school with people who reject the gospel. It's not because we're better than them. That's what we read here at the end of the, uh, the article, that we are not to pride ourselves as having been better than them. Uh, that is simply because of God's sovereign grace. Some he calls to salvation, some he does not. Uh, but the point is, is that there are these different examples, these different um, uh, responses to the gospel. Some believe, some do not. Um, we are called here to pray for those who do not believe the gospel, those who do not embrace Christ. We are also reminded to be very careful that we don't um, uh, call people unbelievers who profess Christ. We don't know their hearts. We, we have a tendency sometimes to to say, I don't think they're really a Christian, but we don't know. We, we don't want to read into things that, that we don't know, and that's what the Article 15 is also pointing out. But again, I think that the primary point for us tonight is to, to understand that, that God didn't owe us salvation. God doesn't owe us anything. And so to have been given salvation, we, we are to respond with the, the most utmost and profound profoundest of thanks to him for what he has done for us and, and to pray for those who do not know Christ and, and to be humble in, in thanking him that, that we have salvation, salvation that, that we do not deserve. Uh, we're going to sing a, a song now that talks about God's grace to us. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. And that really is the, hopefully the prayer of all of us of our church is that we would be heralds of grace. We would be those who herald the gospel and are so thankful for what the Lord has done in our hearts and in our lives. And so let's sing the three stanzas of 429, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and let's stand as we sing.
We come before the Lord in prayer, and we're going to conclude our prayer by praying the Lord's Prayer together. And so let's bow before the Lord. Father, we are so thankful for your grace and your mercy to us. Lord, we thank you that in your grace you, you give to us what we do not deserve. Uh, we do not deserve the forgiveness of our sins. We do not deserve righteousness before you. We do not deserve adoption into your family. We do not deserve to call you our Father. Uh, we do not deserve the gift of the Holy Spirit. We do not deserve eternal life. And yet, Lord, you have freely given us all these things in your grace. And so we come to you tonight with great thanks and praise for giving to us what we do not deserve. And we thank you, Lord, that in your mercy you have withheld from us what we do deserve. We know, Lord, that because of our sin nature and because of the fact that we have broken your law time and time and time again, all of us in this room deserve your eternal judgment. And yet, Father, you have withheld that from us, and that is because you poured out your judgment upon your Son. As we heard this morning from Isaiah 53, you laid our sins upon him, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Uh, He was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, The punishment that we deserve was given to him, And so, Lord, now we have received your mercy, and we thank you, and we praise you. We give you all glory for the great gift of our salvation. We know that this is not because we are better than anyone else. We know that this is not because we deserve it or have earned it, but it is, again, a free gift of your grace. Lord, we also know that there are people who reject the gospel, those who have heard it, those who grew up in Christian homes and who heard it every day and were taken to church every Sunday and yet they continue in their unbelief. We pray for them tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would work in their hearts. We pray that you would open their hearts and their minds to see their condition before you and that they would come to Christ, that they would embrace him, that they would confess him, that they would run to him and find in him the the only one who can save them, the only one who can give them life everlasting. We pray for the ministry of our church that we would continue to herald the gospel, that we would continue to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ saves. And we pray, Lord, that for your church all throughout the world. We pray for pastors and elders and deacons who will Make that a priority in the life of the church, the preaching, the proclamation, the teaching of the gospel. We pray that you would preserve your people from error, that you would preserve your people from false gospels, that you would unite your people around the truth of your word. And and we pray, Lord, that, that you would use your church all throughout the world to continue to proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior. Pray for the church in countries of great persecution, whether it be China or Indonesia, Afghanistan, North Korea, Lord, so many other places. We we pray for those Christians. We pray that you would watch over them. We pray that you would encourage and strengthen them. We pray that it would be your will that their persecution would come to an end. We also pray tonight for the missionaries we support. We pray for their work. And in many, many different countries, Lord, we we pray that, that you would bless their labors Uh, Use them to be beacons of the light of the gospel. We pray for 99 Farmers. We pray for Middle East Reform Fellowship, uh, Modesto Pregnancy Center, Reform Mission Services. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would use these ministries to be a blessing to those around them. We lift up our civil leaders. We pray for our president. We pray for our governor. We pray for those who lead us at the state and local levels. Uh, We ask, Lord, that, that you would cause them to make wise decisions, uh, that they would repent of those decisions that are wicked, those decisions that are immoral, uh, those decisions that are contrary to your word. We pray that you would bring conviction upon their hearts, and we pray that you would provide us in this election year with men and women who stand for truth and stand for righteousness, stand for doing what is right, and will do that which is 
to the benefit of your church and your people. Father, we thank you for uh, the privilege to, to give. We pray as we give to Tepeyac Christian School that you would bless that school. We pray that we would give with hearts of gratitude and we pray for the work of your spirit upon our hearts and minds as we study your word this evening. Lord, help us to understand it. Help us to apply it to our lives. And we conclude now by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now give to Tepeyac Christian School, and that offering will now be taken. Thank you, Marge. Uh, please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read uh, the first 11 verses. My allergies have done a number on my voice last week, and I told my profession of faith class this morning, I, I keep a I keep a stash of throat drops up here, and I told my class that I think I found the world's old, oldest throat drop today when I put it in my mouth, and I think I actually just found the oldest a moment ago. Um, there's some nasty throat drops up here, but we'll see if they work. Um, Matthew chapter 21. One of you uh, wrote on that little card when I asked for you for suggestions, uh, Jesus and the donkey, 
And I'm assuming, since I didn't know who wrote it, I'm assuming this is what you meant. And since this is Palm Sunday, I thought this would be a a good day to look at uh, Jesus and the donkey from Matthew 21. So we'll read uh, verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. If you've uh, read through the Gospels before, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, one of the things that, that may have striked you is, struck you is the number of times that, that Jesus tells people to be quiet, to not say anything about who he is, to not say anything about his miracles, to not say anything about his identity. And, and you might read those places where he says that, and, and you might think, well, why does he do that? For example, in in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus heals two blind men. And immediately after he heals them, he says to them, make sure no one knows about this. Don't tell anyone. In Matthew 16, Peter makes that, that famous confession, that great confession. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And right after he says that, Jesus, the text says, strictly charges Peter and the other disciples to tell no one that Jesus is the Messiah. And and again, we might think, wouldn't Jesus want people to know who he is? Wouldn't he want people to know about his miraculous power? Well, you see, Jesus knew that, that once word got out about his identity as the Messiah, this would raise the ire of the religious leaders in Israel and they would want to kill him. He knew as, as soon as they found out his true identity, that they would want to put him to death. Now Jesus knew he came to die. He, he says in Matthew chapter 20, he says, I didn't come to, to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life, to die as a ransom for many. But, but Jesus knew it also wasn't yet his time to die. And, and so that is why over and over and over, he will say, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Because he knew it wasn't yet his time to die. As we come to chapter 21 tonight, Jesus prepares to enter the city of Jerusalem, and now he knows it is time. It is time. It's time for people to know who he is. It's time for him to, to, to do what he came to do. It is time for him to, to give his life, to die for all of the sins of all of his people. And, and so what we have here in this passage is Jesus' very public declaration of who he is. He is the king, he is the Messiah, and he makes no bones about that as he enters into the city of Jerusalem. There are two parts of this passage tonight. First of all, there is the preparation, and then there is the processional. The preparation and the processional. Jesus and his disciples are are getting closer to Jerusalem, the place where Jesus will be put to death. And, And they come now to Bethpage. Bethpage was a It was a village. It was located on the Mount of Olives. It was about a mile away, a mile east of Jerusalem. So very close to the city at this point. Remember, this is Sunday. Sunday before the Friday that Jesus will die. And and Jesus gets two of his disciples, and he says to them, notice verse 2, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And then he says, if anyone questions you about this, Just tell them the Lord needs them, and they will let you take the donkeys. 
Now, now notice just briefly the, the word Lord there. The Lord needs them. Too often, people have a, a low view of Jesus. Too often, people, even people within the church, don't really recognize and understand the, the fullness of Jesus' identity. We, we might view Jesus merely as meek and, and mild and, and loving, kind of you know, waiting on us to do something. But that's not who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of all. He's not just Lord of the church. He's not just Lord of your Sundays. He's not just Lord of a little slice of your life. He's Lord over all things. And as the Lord, he has the, the right to whatever he wants. Now it's likely that the owner of these donkeys knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus is the Messiah. He knew that Jesus is Lord. And so once the owner hears that it's Jesus who wants these donkeys, immediately he will release the animals. But, but why a donkey? Children, why do, you think, why do you think Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? It's not the most you know, majestic creature, is it? Certainly not something that you would, you would picture a, a great leader, a great king riding on a donkey. Usually when I hear the word donkey, I think of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, the, the little blue-gray donkey who's always kind of, you know, woe is me. Why would Jesus come on a donkey? There are a couple of things to consider. First of all, there is an Old Testament connection to this. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew is filled with Old Testament connections. And when it comes to this donkey, there are... There are two specific connections to the Old Testament. So when we read our Bibles, when we read our New Testaments, it's very important that we see these Old Testament connections. God is, in a sense, connecting the dots for us. In Genesis chapter 49, you, you might remember that's the place where, where uh, Jacob blesses his sons. And, and when he blesses Judah in Genesis 49, he says this, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So stop right there for just a moment. A, a scepter and a ruler's staff are symbolic of a king. And so this is a prophecy that from Judah will come a great king, one who will rule over an everlasting kingdom. It's talking about Jesus. And then in the very next verse, Jacob says this about the coming king. He says, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Isn't that amazing that, that all the way back in the very first book of the Bible, there's this connection that's being made between the great king, the Messiah, and a donkey. But there's also another Old Testament connection. That's, we see it right in our text. If you look at verse 4, it says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, namely Zechariah, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This is a direct quote from Zechariah chapter 9. And so Jesus is saying here, I am fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now I want you to think about something here that that teaches us something about the earthly ministry of Jesus. Now, this isn't just a, an interesting Old Testament connection. This isn't just a, oh, isn't that interesting that, that Genesis 49 talks about a donkey? Isn't it interesting that Zechariah 9 talks about a donkey? Jesus Christ came to fulfill all of God's law perfectly. He came to fulfill all of God's word perfectly. Children, Jesus didn't come just to fulfill 96% of God's law. He didn't come just to fulfill 88% of God's law. He kept and fulfilled all of God's law and all of those Old Testament messianic promises. This is not unimportant. This was, this was crucial for our salvation. We, we must not forget 
that the life of Jesus, the obedience of Jesus, was just as important as the death of Jesus. You know, if if all Jesus had to do was die on the cross, he could have been born and boom, go right to the cross and die for us. But, But you and I need not only our sins to be forgiven, we also need a spotless, perfect righteousness to stand in God's presence. Both are vital. I need, you need the forgiveness of your sins. You need a perfect righteousness. Jesus came to give us both. Jesus lived a perfect life. To to every single one of God's commands, he kept all of God's word perfectly. And that's so that through faith in him, you would have the righteousness you need to stand before God. If he didn't do that, if, if all he did was come and die and, and give you, in a sense, a clean slate, and now it's up to you to keep the slate clean, you and I are in big trouble because we can't do that. Jesus came to wash away our sins, but he also came to give us a perfect righteousness. He lived for us and he died for us. A lot of Christians are, are under the unbiblical notion of thinking, you know, it's great that, that Jesus would would die for me so that my sins would be forgiven, but now it's up to me. It's up to me to to live a certain way, to be obedient enough to be able to stand in God's presence. And I would say to you tonight that if you're living that way, you're living under a, a horrible burden because you'll never be able to do it. You need Jesus' life just as much as you need his death. And and so when we see him fulfilling prophecies, when we see him obeying God's commands, that that should cause a a light to go off in our minds and think, Jesus did that for me. He did that for my righteousness. He did so that that I would be able to stand in his presence. Whenever you read the Gospels and you see Jesus fulfilling something from the Old Testament, it's 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 a clue to stop And give thanks for his perfect life that was lived for you. So that's the first thing about this donkey. There's a a connection to the Old Testament, a very clear connection that Jesus is the Messiah. And and anyone who who knew their Old Testament would have recognized this. Again, previously Jesus did not want his identity to be known, but but now the time has come. As As he rides into the city of Jerusalem, it's as if he's saying, I am he. I am the Messiah. I am the one sent by God. I am the one who has come to deliver his people. I'm the one who has come to fulfill all righteousness. I'm the one who has come to fulfill all of those Old Testament prophecies. But secondly, when we ask the question, why a donkey, there's also the symbolism of a donkey. Children, you you know, and I just said it a moment ago, Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's Lord over all. He, he He is the creator God. Abraham Kuyper is, is famous for having said, you know, there's not, a, there's not a single square inch in this universe over which Jesus Christ, who is king over all, does not say that belongs to me. It all belongs to him. Why would this Lord, why would this great king, why would this creator, why would eternal God come riding on a donkey? Maybe a chariot, maybe a war horse, but a donkey? Children, a donkey is a reminder that Jesus wasn't coming as the kind of Messiah and king that the Jewish people were looking for. We we talked about that this morning. The the Jews were expecting an earthly, powerful Messiah, one who would overthrow the Romans, one who would set up an earthly kingdom, one who would allow them, the Jews, to rule over everything. But that's not why Jesus came. He came in humility. In December, every December, we, we remember the birth of Jesus and, and we remember that he was born, he was born to a young, unknown teenager. He was, he was born in a barn. He grew up in Nazareth. He used to say about Nazareth, can anything good come out of that place? 
Jesus said about himself, he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but I've got nowhere to lay my head. Jesus came to suffer, he came to die for the sake of our sins. Those living in the first century needed to understand that they needed something far more significant than freedom from the Romans. They needed something more significant than a, than a political deliverer. And the same is true today for us. We, we need something far better than deliverance from bad politicians. Now, we need deliverance from bad politicians, but that's not our ultimate need. We need something far better than freedom from a, a lousy boss or freedom from a mean school teacher or freedom from financial struggles. We need to be set free from our sin. We need to be rescued, don't we, from the judgment that we deserve. Left to ourselves, we would all be judged for eternity. This is what we need, and you won't find that in an earthly ruler. You won't find that in a politician. You won't find that in a pastor or any other church leader. You won't find that in your parents. You won't find that in anyone, only Jesus, the one who came to, to live for you, to suffer for you, to die for you. And so when we ask, why a donkey? It, it's a great symbol of the earthly ministry of Jesus. He came in humility. He came to suffer. He came to die. Well, the disciples do what Jesus tells them to do. They, they go into the village. They find the donkey and the colt. They bring him to Jesus. And then notice what they do. They, they lay their coats on the animals, kind of, kind of a saddle for Jesus to sit on. And he sits on the colt. And if you look at the last five words of verse 7, I, I find these interesting. It, it says, and he sat on them. I don't think there are throwaway words in the Bible. I think that's kind of important. I, I think that by sitting on this donkey, Jesus was making a statement. When, when Matthew tells us, and he sat on them, it's, it's Jesus' way of essentially saying, I'm the one Zechariah was talking about. I'm the king. I'm the Messiah. Anyone who ever says, well, Jesus never claimed to be king. He never claimed to be Messiah. He never claimed to be God. They're not reading the Bible. By, by sitting on this donkey, Jesus is making it very clear who he is. And so the stage is set. Jesus is on the donkey. He comes into Jerusalem. Now we see this, this amazing processional. He comes into Jerusalem, and there are two responses. First of all, there's the response of the crowd that is following Jesus. Look at verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, why'd they do that? Kind of weird, right? Why'd they do that? Well, it's a connection, again, to the Old Testament, it's a connection to 2 Kings. In, in 2 Kings chapter 9, the, uh, the people took off their coats and they put them on the ground in front of the king, a man named Jehu. And, and this was seen as an appropriate way to treat a king. This was a symbol of their respect for him. Their willingness to submit to him. And, and that's what this crowd is doing here in Matthew. They, they cut off branches from the palm trees. They spread them on the road, again symbolic of the arrival of a king. And now they begin to shout, verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They're singing. There's another Old Testament connection. This is from the Psalms. You've, you've maybe heard of the Hallel Psalms before. Hallel comes from the word hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. It was the Jewish custom in that day to sing the Hallel songs which were Psalms 113 through 118 during the Passover season. And so what this crowd is, is singing here comes straight out of the hell song, straight out of Psalm 118. And we go, fantastic. They're singing, they're shouting scripture. But again, we have to remember, many people in this day had a misunderstanding of Jesus' mission, misunderstanding of the, what the Messiah had come to do. 
They thought he had come to deliver them from Rome. Today there are people who, who think Jesus came to give them their best life on this earth to give them success and and wealth and long life. What's interesting though, you've got all these people here, all these people following Jesus in this huge crowd, they're all shouting scripture. But just a few days later, Jesus is arrested, nailed to a cross, and where are all these people? They're nowhere to be found. Because essentially they're saying, we didn't, we didn't sign up for this kind of Messiah. We, we want the powerful, earthly Messiah. We want the guy who's going to throw off the Romans. We want the guy who's going to give us what we want in this life. We, we don't want the guy who's going to die on the cross. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't any believers in this crowd, but, but it seems likely that the vast majority of these people are looking for a a Messiah who will give them earthly power and when they realize that wasn't going to happen, they walk away. This is the reality today and the day in which we live as as we preach the gospel to people, as we carry out the ministry of the church. One of Jesus' most well-known parables is the parable of the sower. And, And you remember children in that parable, he talks about the different kinds of soils that there are the different kind of responses to the gospel. There are those who who initially receive the word, but when persecution comes, they fall away. There are those who care more about the things of this life, and when they realize that's not what Christianity is about, they walk away. It seems to be the case here that this crowd is initially very excited, very enthusiastic, but Jesus goes to the cross, and they're gone. I say this because we need to make sure that we do not have an unbiblical idea of who Jesus is or an unbiblical idea of of why he came. Children, as you grow up, remember, Jesus didn't come to make you successful in this life. Now you may, God may give you success in this life. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come so you have a lot of friends at school. Jesus didn't come so that you would be a great athlete. Jesus didn't come so that you would be a a successful business person. Jesus came to deal with our greatest problem. He came to deal with the problem of our sin and to rescue us from judgment. He came to give us eternal life. Not blessings in this life though he may give us those things, but he came to give us eternal life. That's why he came. There's also the response, though, of those who are in Jerusalem. There's the response of those who are following him. Now there's the response of those in the city. Jesus enters Jerusalem. He he comes into the city. Matthew tells us the whole crowd is stirred up. Stirred up means agitated, troubled. Actually, it also means fearful, You you can picture the scene. You've got about 500,000 people packed into the city of Jerusalem for Passover. And and by the way, the custom of that day was that when you entered Jerusalem, you did so on foot. You you walked in. You didn't ride on a donkey. You walked. There's one who isn't walking. There's one who's riding a donkey. And so you've got all these people in this city You've got this large crowd of people following a man riding on a donkey. And it's troubling the city. It's brought great agitation to the city. They're all asking the same question. Who is this guy who's riding into the city on a donkey? Notice the answer, verse 13, or verse 11. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. You know, there are some answers that contain the truth but don't go far enough. For example, if if someone looked at your wife and and asked you, who is she? And you said, um, uh, she's a woman and her name is such and such. Well, that would be true. Your wife is a woman and she does have a name. But there's a sense in which that answer doesn't go far enough. She's your wife. She's your life partner. She's your best friend. 
The, the answer that the crowd gives here in verse 11 is true. Jesus is a prophet. He is the greatest prophet, and he is from Nazareth. But he's more than that. He's more than that. He's the eternal God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the savior of his people. He's Lord over all. And unfortunately, the vast majority of those in Jerusalem on that day didn't get this. They said that which was true, but their answer didn't go far enough. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is not just from Nazareth. Maybe you've heard of the um, uh, New City Catechism before. New City Catechism is a a pretty new catechism. came out a few years ago. It's based on the Heidelberg Catechism. It's really good. Maybe you've done it with your kids or something, but it's a really good catechism. Question 20 of the New City Catechism asks a very simple question. The question is, who's the Redeemer? Who is the Redeemer? The answer is, the only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin himself. That's the answer the crowd should have given. That's who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey that day, the eternal Son of God, the one who became man, the one who obeyed God's law perfectly, the one who bore the penalty for our sin in himself. That is who he is. I ask you tonight, individually, what is your response to him? What is your response to Jesus? Do you embrace him as your Lord and Savior? Do you trust him alone to save you, to rescue you, to take you to heaven? You know, one day Jesus will ride on another animal, won't he? But it won't be a donkey. In Revelation chapter 19, you probably remember this when we went through Revelation together, the Apostle John says in Revelation 19, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Brothers and sisters, on that day, Jesus will not come in humility. And he will not come on a donkey. He will come on a horse, symbol of war, symbol of victory. He will come in great power to to bring judgment upon all who have rejected him. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? terrifying thing it will be that day for those who have not embraced Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But if you are trusting Christ to save you, you don't need to fear that day. You don't need to fear the one who will be riding on the horse that day. And the reason you you don't need to fear him is because your Savior, who, who is the Lord and King over all, came to this earth in humility, accomplished your salvation by living for you and dying for you. And so when he comes that day and and we see him coming in his great power, we can look up with joyful hearts. We can look up with great expectation. And rather than saying, like many people will say on that day, as they cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb, we can with joy say, this is the one who came in humility the first time for me. 
And now what a joyful day it is when he comes and takes us all to our heavenly home. Won't that be a joyful, joyful reunion? Won't that be a wonderful day when Jesus takes us home? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a Savior who came in humility. He came, Lord, to suffer. He came to be insulted. He came to be rejected. He came to be unjustly accused. He came to die so that we might live. And Lord, now as we await his second coming when he rides on a horse, that will be a joyful day for us. Lord, help us to warn people, to warn those who do not know him, to flee to him while there is still time to escape the judgment that is coming and instead with joy welcome that day with glad and happy hearts. We thank you for your grace in our lives, allowing us, causing us to see who Jesus is and to embrace him as Lord and Savior. We pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna sing number 333. Number 333, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. We will sing all the stanzas and let's stand as we sing. Praise the Lord God, all you nations. Number 117B is our doxology. And before we sing that, the Lord sends us into a new week with his blessing. And so receive that blessing now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.